Hi, my name is Atif Darwish, professor and consultant of obstetrics and gynecology. Today, I'd like to discuss with you an important practical topic of hydrocybics. What to do if you face a case of hydrocybics in your clinic? How uh, to manage this case and what to tell your patients? Is it possible to conserve this uh, hydrocybics and keep this fallopian tube or to occlude it, to disconnect it, or to remove it completely? This is the target of this topic. We know that hydrocybics is distal occlusion of the fallopian tube. And when you see a case of hydrocybics, you have to suspect a PID a history of this patient or previous pelvic surgery as they are the main causes of occlusion of the fallopian tube. And actually hydrocybics presents around 10 to 30% of cases of tubal factor of infertility, which represents a quarter of infertility uh, in females. And hydrocyclic is not just occlusion of the fallopian tube, it leads to some problems uh, to cause infertility and to decrease pregnancy rate for those ladies, including disruption of the uh, endometrial environment, mechanical and chemical factors, uh, direct toxic effect on the sperm motility, direct embryo toxicity, poor endometrial receptivity, uh, including affection of some important materials like cytokines, steroid hormones, with ties, growth factors, enzymes, and a gene which is called hoxa tin gene. All these are effects of the fluid entrapped inside this occluded uh, fallopian tube. And all societies, including ASRM, uh, SRS, and others, mentioned that uh, hydrocyclic leads to decreased pregnancy rate to identical negative effect in both fresh and frozen embryo transfer cycles and to lead to miscarriage rate higher than normal uh, by 2.3 uh, times. So hydrocyclic is uh, causing a deleterious effect on the female and one of the main causes of decreased pregnancy rate. Simply, you can diagnose it by HSG if you see a report like this with uh, 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 echogenic shadow uh, signifying the occluded tube, or by ultrasound, sometimes you see uh, sonolucent tubular shadow with uh, characteristic uh, uh, trapeculations of hyper echogenic shadow, but not communicating to the outside signifying convolutions of the fallopian tube. And you can do uh, 3D ultrasonography or 4D ultrasonography if it is moving and to see the uh, shape of the fallopian tube in the 3D picture. And if you use Doppler ultrasound, you can see the feeding blood vessels to this fallopian tube uh, by this as seen in this picture. All these are some diagnostic issues for hydrocyclic sometimes and rarely we rely on MRI, and usually we don't request MRI for such a case, and it appears as a tortuous tubular structure with hyperintense signal. Of course, the definite diagnosis of hydrocyclics is laparoscopy. And at laparoscopy, if you see a fallopian tube with distal occlusion as hydrocyclics, you have to think what to do in such a case, and you are intraoperative and the patient is under general anesthesia. I may make conservative surgery or radical surgery. Conservative surgery means preservation of the fallopian tube. And conservative surgery may be leaving, aiming to uh, leave a functioning tube, which is called salpingoneostomy. So salpingoneostomy is a functional conservative surgery. But sometimes you conserve the fallopian tube for the lady, but it will not be a functioning tube, uh, like disconnection of the fallopian tube, occlusion of the fallopian tube, ultrasound aspiration and injection of some uh, materials like ethanol or others, or sclerotherapy. But sometimes you decide to excise the fallopian tube completely, which is a radical line of treatment, which is called salpingoneostomy which is called salpingectomy, I'm sorry. Salpingectomy is a functional conservative surgery aiming at leaving a functioning fallopia tube to get pregnant for this lady later on. And this salpingectomy relies on the status of the mucosal fold inside the fallopian tube. 
And since a long time, there is a tubal mucosal scoring system, which means that score one and two normal falls of the mucosa of fallopian tube, while uh, score five means disruption or uh, distorted falls of the fallopian tube, and three and four are four lesions or adhesions. So if you see the mucosal falls of the fallopian tube normal, this means that there is a good prognosis for this case, and you can proceed to serpentium. How can I see the mucosal folds? This can be done after opening the fallopian tube. So uh, the steps will be shown uh, soon, but if you see the mucosal folds, major and minor folds of the fallopian tube normal, this carries a good prognosis and you can proceed to do serpentoneostomy. This is number one for decision making for such a case. And of course, serpentoneostomy is indicated for young patients desiring uh, future fertility with isolated distal tubal occlusion. I mean, no combined proximal and distal tubal occlusion because this combination is called bipolar or coaxial occlusion carries very poor prognosis. If you have a patient with uh, negative uh, hydrotubation test from down, no dye filling inside the tube and the distal end is also occluded, don't waste time. Don't lose your uh, time to make serpentinoostomy and uh, tubal cannulation for the proximal part. This tube carries poor prognosis simply because it is a pathologic fallopian tube. In such a case, you have to proceed to uh, assisted reproduction. So it is, uh, serpentinoostomy is indicated if there is thin walled hydrocyanics, minimal or no mucosal adhesions, preserved mucosal folds, as I told you in the scoring systems, and this can be shown by serpentinoostomy, as you will see soon. Now, what are the steps of opening a fallopian tube? It is not just opening, make an open and goodbye. This is not a surgery. The surgery starts by mobilization of the fallopian tube. Usually the fallopian tube is adherent to the ovary or the fallopian tube itself called on itself. Sometimes it's adherent to the back of the uterus, the, the urinary bladder, to the uh, fundus of the uterus or lateral pelvic wall. In such a case, if you just open the fallopian tube, this will not be a function in fallopian tube, even being a patent. As I told you before, the functioning fallopian tube should be patent and mobile with uh, preserved functions of the fallopian tube. So if you see some vestigial remnants like those cases, you can puncture them and coagulate them. You have to mobilize the fallopian tube from the ovary here are tubo ovarian dense adhesions. You have to mobilize the uh, tube from the ovary and you, uh, in such a case, you have to use alternating coagulating and uh, uh, cutting modes. And sometimes you, you use spray coagulation because when you are reaching to the feeding blood vessel, uh, excessive bleeding is expected. So you have to uh, use alternating uh, modes of the uh, diathermy in such a case. And the distal end of the fallopian tube is mobilized, but the middle segment is not yet mobilized. You have to proceed to make mobilization and freeing of the uh, middle segment of the fallopian tube. So the first step was to mobilize the fallopian tube. And I think this is very crucial for doing this procedure. All of mobilization is half of the success of the operation. Like, uh, vasicovaginal fistula, like uh, rectovaginal uh, fistula, like uh, uh, like perineal tears. If you don't mobilize organs, success will be uh, very minimal. So mobilization of the fallopian tube is not to be forgotten as a very important initial step. Now I mobilize the fallopian tube. What to do? The second step is to make a new ostium. It is called new ostium, which means new ostium. Sometimes you can see remnants of the fimbria like this case, and you have to go by a needle or by forceps to this part, and better to go with a curved forceps like Rougie or Maryland forceps, and you widen it uh, like Hilton's technique, and you use fine needle to make incisions over this widen distal end of the fallopian tube 
to make an incisions which are maybe crochet incisions or whatever you see but put in mind that your new uh, ostium should focus the pelvis the direction of the new ostium should be directed to the uh, pelvis because simply the fimbria should move to pick up the oocyte from the uh, pouch of Douglas. So the direction of the new ostium should be towards the pelvis, not to be uh, upwards and to make an ostium towards the abdomen. This will not be a uh, functioning tube. So you make widening of the opening and, and now you uh, confirm passage of methylene blue test by hydrotubation test, and you continue to make widening of the opening by crochet incisions to avoid its closure. But this will not guarantee that the fallopian tube will close or not close again. This is the first method of opening of the fallopian tube using a needle of the therme to have this new opening. And you can simply see the mucosa seen in between. Sometimes you can use uh, micro scissors to make this opening, particularly if this case similar to phimosis, more or less phimosis or hydrocyvix. And this case can be uh, opened by micro scissors and micro scissors has the advantages over the uh, dathermy in being without uh, energy uh, uh, injury to the mucosa or to the wall of the fallopian tube and no primary or secondary coagulation effect. So you can open the fimbrial end with the micro scissors. And of course you can face some minimal bleeding, which is acceptable and can be controlled with time without the use of the thermi. So opening can be done by needle, fine needle connected to the thermi, uh, with our monopolar, or sometimes we use bipolar fine needle with with two ends, fine ends, and you can use micro scissors to achieve this uh, open uh, uh, this target, which is opening of the uh, ostium, which is new ostium formation and new opening. And of course, it should be widened as much as you can to avoid uh, reclosure. And this can be done by uh, frequent suturing and avoiding excessive suturing to avoid excessive bleeding and this is uh, mandatory for uh, keeping the uh, ostium as wide as you can. And then you can insert a grasper inside the fallopian tube and grasp the mucosa to be out. And here some uh, fimbrial uh, ends are extracted outside. And this is important to keep the uh, fimbria and the mucosa outside to avoid reclosure. So these are two techniques to do new ostium formation. But if I open the fallopian tube, I should evaluate what's inside the fallopian tube. In such a case, this tube has been opened and you can grasp the mucosa and see no mucosal folds at all, just the remnants of the major folds here and no minor folds, of course. And this tube is a functionless fallopian tube, is useless fallopian tube and it's a waste of time to keep this tube opening. On the other hand, if you uh, ha have some promising fallopian tube and mucosa, like major folds, and so you can insert a hysteroscope with its, uh, its sheath inside it from an auxiliary portal, and you inflate the uh, open fallopian tube with saline and to see the mucosa inside, and you can see the mucosal folds, major folds and minor folds, and you can see if the patient has some adhesions or uh, some abnormalities inside fallopian tube or not. And this is a good uh, way you are inside now, you are inside the fallopian tube. This is a good way to assess the fallopian tube from inside and see the mucosa folds, major folds, how you are seen and some minor folds. And this is all of the fallopian tube thinned in many areas due to the chronic retention of the fluid inside the fallopian tube. So you can evaluate the fallopian tube using serpentoscope, which is a hysteroscope. You have a hysteroscope in your OR, so no need to buy a special tool for serpentoscopy, just a hysteroscope and insert it, and you can see the mucosa and the mucosal folds 
uh, will by this uh, telescope by, uh, by inserting it to the new ostium and to uh, fimbria. Uh, and you can go forward and backward to search for any abnormalities. But, but you know that serpentoscope is a, an endoscope of the distal part of the scolopent tube. When you reach to the ismic part, it cannot see anything because it is very thin. And in such a case, if you need to evaluate the proximal part, you have to use the falloposcope, and the falloposcope is uh, inserted from the vagina to the tube. Here, in this case, you can see uh, the fallopian tube with some fine adhesions inside, uh, signifying the cause of this cause of uh, uh, hydrosalvins. And of course, uh, these adhesions can be cut with the edge of the telescope if they are fine. And sometimes you may need some scissors to uh, insert, uh, to cut these thick uh, bands of adhesions uh, to make the uh, tubal lumen normal and suitable for implantation, you know, the uh, fertilization, you know, the fertilization occurs in the ampulla. Here's some fine adhesions and could be seen by the cell pinjoscope when you are inside the fallopian tube to see uh, these lesions that may uh, be caused by the retention of fluid and the infection uh, that causes uh, hydrocervix. So this is the number three. Number one was mobilization of the fallopian tube. Number two, new opening. Number three, evaluation of the endocervix. And number four is to maintain the patent fallopian tube. After opening and after evaluation of the mucosa that the patient has major faults and some minor faults, okay, I need to maintain this ostium to avoid its uh, reclosure. And this can be done bluntly by blunt inversion of the uh, uh, inner part of the fallopian tube to outer part. And this can be done by introduction of uh, delicate grasping forceps to keep the inner part outside. And the very vascular tube is a good tube because it is well vascularized without adhesions. But of course, this technique is usually followed by occlusion. And in such a case, you have to uh, perform a better technique, which is thermal flowering technique which means an in, in, uh, introduction of diathermy, uh, monopolar diathermy, coagulation of the uh, tubes outside, just outside the new ostium to make eversion of the tube outside and to avoid its reclosure. And in such a case, the mucosa is well seen with major faults and with the methylene blue dye and the distal end is everted outside. Sometimes you can use uh, suturing, and of course, suturing is more uh, delicate and more important for preserving a function fallopian tubal ostium, uh, distal ostium, and to avoid uh, the thermic injury. And you can take stitches uh, to fix the edges of the new ostium to the wall of the fallopian tube. And this can be achieved by using delicate sutures. Uh, 4O or 5O sutures, this is suitable for the uh, delayed absorbable sutures, this is suitable for the distal end of the fallopian tube. And this is important uh, because uh, prevention of reclosure is one of the main targets of uh, uh, surgery for uh, uh, distal tubal occlusion. Okay, you make uh, some stitches to avoid the closure. Don't forget to take biopsy from the distal part of the fallopian tube to search for what is the cause of occlusion. Is it chronic infection? Is chronic disease like tuberculosis, blood diseases, other diseases, or some uh, abnormal pathology and even uh, uh, tumors of the fallopian tube? Don't forget to take biopsy and to have post operative care like rinsing of the cutaneous cavity with complete removal of debris, blood clots, or some tissues. And don't hesitate to help your patient if even has two bilateral hydrocervix. Some doctors, when see bilateral hydrocervix, uh, take the simplest way to occlude one and, or to disconnect one 
and to open the other. No, if the fallopian tube looks healthy from outside and mucosa is preserved, you can proceed to do bilateral salpingium neostomy. And this is a recent study on 480 uh, cases with bilateral salpingium neostomy with good successful uh, uh, results. What are the drawbacks of salpingium neostomy? It may Reoclude, it uh, reclose and increases the rate of top pregnancy as high as 10% has been reported dissemination of infection with low pregnancy rate, uh, depending on the mucosa and wall thickness. If they are uh, uh, lost mucosa, thick wall, the pregnancy rate may drop uh, as low as 0%. But if the tubal damage is absent with good wall, good subbendoscopy, uh, the result may be 80% of cases. Now we move directly to another line of treatment, uh, which is radical surgery excision of the fallopian tube, which is serpingectomy. And this can be done by uh, endoscopic staplers, uh, ligature, endocoagulation, bipolar coagulation, uh, ligature, uh, uh, and this, uh, these are different tools. The key of success of doing bipolar salpingectomy is to think of the ovary and the ovarian supply. You have to make traction on the fallopian tube all the time outside uh, to laterally away from the ovary. And you start by disconnection of tube ovarian ligament, disconnection of the tube from the uh, uh, tube from the ovary and disconnect the fallopian tube from the uterus and send it to the histopathology, of course. And when you use bipolar diathermy, this is much more bitter than monopolar due to absence of secondary coagulation. And you can use the staplers, you can use stitches, whatever you have. And the advantages of serpentectomy include improved implantation rate, and it does not affect ovarian reserve and does not reduce antrophoricate count, while the disadvantages of serpentectomy include, uh, include uh, fine, fine, uh, it is a final decision with no chance to natural pregnancy if bilateral, uh, it may carry some psychological upset for the ladies that she removed uh, the tube or tubes with some financial burden and some surgical uh, risks, of course. Now we move to conservative, which means preservation of the fallopian tube, but non-function which includes ultrasound guided aspiration, a hysteroscopic occlusion, sclerotherapy, or disconnection. And some scarce studies uh, like this study on fluid aspiration and un under ultrasound guidance during or after oocyte retrieval, which showed increased uh, clinical and biochemical uh, pregnancy rate and some studies on sclerotherapy, case reverse injection of 98% ethanol under ultrasound guidance and other scarce studies. So these are the varieties of treatment. What should I select for my patient? You have to go back directly to evidence-based medicine. And if you look to the literature, you will find some comments on salpingectomy as being the optimal surgical approach and should be uh, recommended for all cases of hydrocybics by some authors. Uh, and others mentioned that uh, after meta-analysis of at least five randomized studies and nine observational studies, the uh, mean number of retrieved oocyte uh, uh, life uh, pairs and clinical pregnancy rates and plantation rates increased in the salpingectomy patients uh, more than patients without salpingectomy uh, procedure before. On the other hand, some studies encourage doing serpentinous to me, and here is a meta-analysis or systematic review and meta-analysis of uh, 22 studies, which found that the pooled natural pregnancy rate uh, after serpentinous to me cumulative clinical pregnancy rate uh, 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 and pooled miscarriage rate uh, uh, improved after serpentinous to me, and this is another study. Another study mentions that proximal tubal occlusion should be considered more than salpingectomy when dealing with hydrocybics, especially for patients with ovarian reserve. Accusing salpingectomy is a cause of disturbing ovarian reserve. And this is a meta-analysis of 23 studies suggesting that salpingectomy uh, 
will affect uh, ovarian reserve much more than proximal tuber occlusion, and this is a recent study. Actually, the uh, technique of serpentinoostomy is a missed technique and lost technique uh, in many centers, and all doctors uh, performing laparoscopy are uh, heroic in deciding to uh, excise the fallopian tube and to proceed to uh, IVF ICSI. Uh, and they don't give uh, their patients enough time to uh, have a conservative functional approach for this fallopian tube. Here is a study on uh, 11 parallel design uh, randomized control trials involving around 1,386 participants. And the technique of salpingectomy, of course, increased clinical pregnancy rate. Uh, and the lowest clinical pregnancy rate uh, was recorded in patients without prior surgery or intervention for hydrocervix. And if uh, ladies had uh, tuber occlusion, the pregnancy rate between 21 to 74 versus 11 uh, versus 12 uh, percent uh, if no surgery was performed. So tuber occlusion also achieved some success rate. And if we compare tuber occlusion versus serpentectomy, the results were in uncertain in these randomized controlled trials. And transvaginal aspiration of hydrocerbingeal fluid uh, uh, has insufficient evidence to support it. So now, back to evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is not a holy book. It's not a rule, solid rule we have to follow. Evidence-based medicine puts to you uh, some guidelines for managing your patient. But you have to put in your mind best available evidence, clinicians' guidance, and patients' value. What is the value of doing this procedure or that procedure for my patients based on the uh, age, based on functional status, comorbidities, uh, lifestyle, social support, financial circumstances, and the capacity of this uh, workload? So deciding to do salpingectomy or salpingeoneostomy or other conservative non-functional techniques depends upon your patient. You have to be a clever doctor. If you have a very poor patient, not suitable to do uh, uh, assisted reproduction, you have to exert the best effort to keep function, uh, functional uh, conservative approach for these ladies. Uh, if the patient is old age and she has little time, you have to proceed to disconnection to start uh, a procedure of IVF ICSI. So evidence-based medicine is not a solid uh, rule. We have to follow it as a guidance according to the previous studies, according to the experience of other doctors before and recommendations of the societies. But decision should be individualized. And here comes the rule of what's called precision medicine or individualized medicine. And this is different from uh, uh, evidence-based medicine as precision medicine makes individualization of the treatment while evidence-based medicine is a, a decision for a group of people. We should stress on some uh, situations like frozen pelvis late discovery and frozen pelvis means this turbid anatomy risk of uh, uh, vital organ injury and possible failed access due to extensive pelvic adhesions. In such a case, some studies reported robotic surgery to be successful in such a case of frozen pelvis due to the advantage, well-known advantages of the three-dimensional magnification of the mobilization of the jaws of the instruments and precise uh, movements, avoidance of tremors of the hands, and so on. All these are the advantages of the uh, robotic surgery over conventional laparoscopic surgery. And if you have a patient with frozen pelvis and you cannot see anything by laparoscopy and the intestine is sealed to the uterus and ovaries, and you don't have robotic surgery and you don't have time to uh, be uh, 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 to be uh, performing uh, to perform uh, such a tedious 
robotic surgery. In such a case, you can make a proximal tubal occlusion with issue like this case of insertion of issue from the uh, uterine side by hysteroscopy, you insert and load the issue as a method of occlusion of the proximal part to uh, avoid the uh, propagation of hydrosalpine gel fluid into the endometrial cavity. However, it leaves a solid part inside the endometrial cavity, which leads to a decreased fertilization rate. Also, there is propagation of some hydrosalpine gel fluid and higher miscarriage rate uh, reported in some studies with low clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rate could be due to increased fluid within the uh, uterine cavity as reported by some authors. So we performed a technique of hysteroscopic proximal tubal occlusion, which was published in 2007, which is uh, uh, occlusion of the proximal part of the fallopian tube without leaving any foreign body inside the endometrial cavity. And this technique by insertion of a, a ruler pole, a small ruler pole uh, of the uh, receptoscope inside the peritubal pulse, which is a part of the darus triad, including the lateral uh, emerging walls of the intermural part and the dark spots of the tip of this uh, conical part and the ostium, of course. So the technique is inside the darus triad and avoids leaving any scar inside the endometrial cavity. So the endometrial cavity will be left free for implantation. However, we achieved a, a complete occlusion of the hydrocervics in this study in only 64% of cases. And so it is not 100% success case, but it has advantages over issue of leaving uh, free cavity for implantation. Now, another question, when you have a patient with hydrosalmix accidentally discovered during induction of ovulation or during egg retrieval uh, for uh, IVF XC, in such a case, it's better to do what's called freeze-all technique or strategy to avoid and you make aspiration or excision of this fallopian tube and after this procedure, you can go to uh, fertilization of these embryos and uh, uh, um, uh, embryo transfer uh, after uh, this technique. So in such a case, if you are confronted with or accidentally discovered cervix, there is a rescue strategy of freeze all and subsequent IVF exilator. So in conclusion, I would say that hydrocervix is a real cause of subfertility or infertility according to the recommendation of all societies. Its treatment is challenging for the doctor and the patient. Optimal treatment should be individualized, which is precision medicine. And keep conservation in your mind whenever possible, conservation with function in fallopian tube whenever possible. And more research is required to define the impact of tubal status and surgical tool on the decision of conservative or radical therapy. And thank you very much. If you like this section, please uh, press on like icon and don't forget to uh, press on prescribe uh, subscribe icon to have more lectures. And thank you very much.